Dead America, Low Country, Part 4 Written by Derek Slayton Narrated by Aaron Smith Chapter 1 Day Zero Plus Three The sun barely peeked over the horizon when the noise began. Dante opened his eye, waiting a moment for it to adjust to the dim light. He couldn't quite make out the sound. It was almost as if someone was moving in another part of the house. He looked around, doing a quick head count of his companions. Cam and Philip slept by the TV. Bailey was on the couch, and Lily sprawled across the floor beside Katie, who was clustered up against the stove to avoid the splayed limbs. Dante listened hard, straining his ears but didn't hear Abigail or her girls moving. And while he had only known Ace for a couple of days, he couldn't imagine the redneck had ever been this quiet in his life. The noise persisted, a shuffling combined with light tapping. He jumped at a loud bang and sat up straight. The others stirred up in the living room, but he hopped up, rushing past them to the window. He peered through the gaps in the wood that Cam and Philip had put up the day before. The sun was up just enough that he could see movement by Ace's window. Two zombies stood there, smacking on the wood blocking Ace's bedroom. Dante sighed with relief. It was only two, and the boys had done a good job of securing the outside of the house. Movement tickled his periphery, and his relief quickly flew from him as three more ghouls raced out from behind the trees at the edge of the yard. They ran straight for their brethren, joining in on the banging on the side of the house. The impact roused everyone that had still been sleeping in the living room. Dante's brow furrowed at another zombie, moving much slower than the others, instead of at a dead sprint. What's going on? Cam asked groggily. Dante turned away from the window. Unwanted visitors. Just tell them to come back later, Cam moaned, throwing an arm over his face and then sat up straight. Fear in his eyes as it clicked that they were in the middle of a zombie apocalypse, and the people outside weren't salesmen. He shook Philip. Get up, man! Get up! he urged. His companion rolled towards him, propping his arm up on his elbows. Dude, are you kidding me right now? he whined. The pounding on the side of the house intensified, and Cam shook his head. Dante, what is it? Lily asked, rubbing sleep from her eyes as she emerged from the kitchen. Ace's room, Dante replied. She looked around, grabbing a big butcher knife from the counter and heading down the hall with him to her cousin's room. As they moved down the hallway, Abigail opened the spare room's door. Is everything okay? she asked. Dante nodded. Everything's fine, he replied gently. Just some early morning visitors. Just stay in your room for a bit while we handle it. Abigail nodded, and Bailey approached, slipping inside and kneeling next to her sister's cot. Don't worry, she said firmly to the terrified girls. Dante's going to protect us. The kids looked up at him, and he gave them a nod, and then Abigail shut the door. Dante paused at Ace's door and side-glanced his companion. Do we knock or what? he asked. Depends, Lily replied with a smirk. Does Ace strike you as the type of person you want to just walk in on unannounced? Dante immediately shook his head. I've seen enough horror for the last few days, he declared. Let's give him a few minutes to cover up. Lily laughed and banged her fist on the door. Get your ass up, boy. We got a situation, she barked. There was no sound from the room other than the consistent smacking of the zombies. She furrowed her brow and pounded again. Ace, open up, cuz, she yelled. There was still no answer, and they shared a concerned glance, and Dante slowly turned the doorknob. He pushed it open, the door creaking as he carefully revealed whatever sight awaited them inside. The duo recoiled at the sight of Ace sprawled on the bed, stretching over the entirety of the queen-size mattress, wearing only a tattered pair of tidy whities he wore a large set of headphones, a long cord connecting them to a CD player on the side table. The banging on the window was loud, but they could hear the music blaring from the headphones over it. 
It's a wonder he's not deaf, Dante muttered, looking away from the scantily clad redneck. Lily rolled her eyes. You check our guests, she said. I'll awaken Sleeping Beauty. Good luck, he said wryly, and headed for the window. He peered through the slats, seeing the five zombies right outside. Four of them were right up against the window, banging away, while the fifth, slow one, was just reaching the group. Lily grabbed Ace's leg with both hands and gave it a good shake, acting like it was a zombie clutching him just before biting. The sensation startled Ace awake, who began flailing about in a panic. He screamed and tore the headphones from his head, scrambling to the head of the bed, eyes wide. What in the holy motherfucking shitballs are you doing, woman? He cried, when he realized it was just his cousin. I thought I was getting eaten. She wrinkled her nose. With the way your tidy whities are stained, they'd really have to be slumming it, she said, clucking her tongue. He looked down, realizing how exposed he was, and hopped away from the bed to find a pair of jeans on the floor. He threw them on, zipping up as he looked around, confused. What the hell is that noise? he asked. Zombies, Dante replied. Ace blinked, just realizing that the bigger man was in the room too, but headed over to the window to survey the situation. He peeked through the slats, scanning the ghouls. Holy shit, that's the Robinsons, he muttered, looking over the older couple with three teenagers. Everyone but the woman had visible bite marks on them. You know them? Lily asked, approaching them. Ace nodded. Yeah, they had that house at the edge of town, he explained, motioning vaguely. Built it a few years back. Guessing that's not one we cleared, Dante asked. The redneck shook his head. I didn't think we needed to, he admitted. The morning this all started, I saw a big old SUV pulling out of the driveway and hauling ass out of town. Looks like whoever left, it wasn't them, Lily murmured. Well, obviously, Lil, Ace said, rolling his eyes. Ignoring them, she peered through the wood to get a good look at them. Judging by the looks of them, the mama keeled over and took the rest of them with her, she said. Met Fred there a few times, Ace declared. He always struck me as a bit of a wuss. No surprise he got eaten up by his wife. Lily crossed her arms. Apparently his kids didn't fare much better. There are any other houses you think are empty but we didn't check? Dante asked. Ace shrugged. Well, hell. Based on this, I think we need to check the rest of them, he suggested. There's one more beside their house, and two more on the other side of the gas station. I saw them leaving that morning, but now that I think about it, they could have left someone behind. Dante nodded in agreement. Well, that's going to have to be after breakfast, Lily cut in, still looking out the window. We gotta figure out what to do about these five first. Ace cracked a smile and headed for the closet. He rummaged around for a few moments and then returned with a large medieval-looking sword. Dante and Lily blinked at him as he held it up in a victory pose. Okay, King Arthur, Lily drawled. What in the hell are you planning on doing with that thing? No, wait, scratch that, she held up a finger. First question, why in the hell do you have that? Ace grinned. You remember a few years back when I was dating Betty Sue? He asked. Yeah, she replied, raising an eyebrow. Well, she dragged me to one of those renaissance fairs down near Savannah, he explained. And let's just say I got caught up in it. Saw this on the way out and just had to have it. Lily crossed her arms. Somehow I doubt that a sword from a renaissance fair is going to be a viable weapon, she said dryly. He pointed it up and touched the tip of his finger to the pointy end playfully recoiling as if it were incredibly sharp. I know I'm not going to hack through them, he admitted, but this thing is solid enough that a direct shot to the face should do some damage. It looks thin enough to get through the wooden openings, Dante added. Can't hurt to try. Lily stared at him, eyebrows raised, disbelieving that the tall man would buy into her cousin's ridiculousness. 
Dante just smiled and shrugged. Yeah, I know. I'm just as shocked as you are, he admitted. She shook her head and chuckled, turning towards the window and sliding it open. The noise intensified as she did so. The zombies moaning accompanying the loud banging. Their thrashing grew more excited when they realized they were so close to a fresh meal. Well, let's see if this works, Ace said, and put the tip of the sword on one of the wooden boards. Lining up his shot with the zombie's face, one of the teenage zombies had pushed its way to the front of the pack, its face missing a good chunk of flesh from the cheek. Ace readied himself, getting into position, and then thrusting forward. The sword slid perfectly through the opening, the tip of the blade piercing the zombie's roomy eye. The creature convulsed for a moment before sliding off of the blade and down to the ground only to be immediately replaced by one of its family members. Ace pulled the gooey sword back inside, shooting his cousin a triumphant smile. Ren fair for the win, what what? he declared. She rolled her eyes, leaning against the wall. Yeah, yeah, she said flippantly. He lined up another shot, this time on the ghoul that used to be Fred Robinson. All right, time to put you out of your misery, he cooed and then thrust again. The blade cracked through the bridge of the zombie's nose, entering into its skull. As the heavier ghoul fell limp, it didn't dislodge from the sword, and when Ace tried to pull on it, he couldn't get it back out. Son of a bitch! Let go, Fred! Ace bellowed. The remaining zombies outside thrashed about, putting weight on Fred as they tried to get at the source of the noise. One of them pushed down, causing the sword to bend. It didn't take much more pressure for the blade to snap in two, leaving the broadsword a short sword. Ace pulled the busted hilt back inside and stared at it for a moment, before tossing it over his shoulder back towards the closet. Well, got my money's worth out of it at least, he drawled. Well, technically, I got my money's worth out of it after the Ren Fair because Betty Sue was all into that medieval shit. That night we... Stop talking, Lily cut in, putting up her hand. I just watched you impale two zombies. But if you finish your thought, I'm going to throw up. Ace chuckled and turned to Dante. What do you say, he said. You want to go finish them off outside so we can have some breakfast in peace? Lead the way, Dante replied, motioning for the door. The redneck nodded. We'll head out the back and stop by the shed, he said. Got another idea of something I've always wanted to try. Three of us should be able to take them out pretty easily, Lily added. Dante cocked his head. Actually, I'd like you to stay here. Don't go getting all protective on me now, she replied with a pout. He raised his hands. I would never dream of it, he promised. But they're fixated on us right now. I just want you to hold their attention while we come around behind them. She smirked and gave him a playful punch on the arm. Just giving you a hard time, she replied. I'll keep him occupied. She winked at him and then stood in front of the window, making silly faces at the zombies clamoring to eat her through the wood. Ace led Dante out through the living room, where the other three were perched on the couch, looking nervously all around. Is everything okay? Katie asked. Dante nodded. Yeah, just a few of the neighbors paying a visit, he said. We should only be a couple of minutes, so you guys hang tight. The trio nodded, and the two men headed through the kitchen. Dante grabbed a handgun from the counter as they went, pausing at the back door to make sure there weren't any more unwanted guests. Ace peered around too, and thankfully the backyard was empty. Dante inclined his head towards the small wooden tool shed at the back. So... You got something useful in there? he asked. Oh yeah, and better than that, I already have an idea, Ace declared. His companion raised his eyebrow. Color me impressed, he admitted, and terrified. Ace laughed and opened the door. The two of them darted over to the shed, the redneck slipping inside while Dante kept watch. There was a clamor in the shed before Ace emerged, holding a giant pitchfork and a sledgehammer. 
Dante stared at him for a moment. Really? he finally asked. Oh yeah, really, Ace replied with a huge grin on his face. He held up the pitchfork, which had foot-long spikes at the end. He handed over the sledgehammer. Dante took it and tested its considerable weight in his hand. So, what's the plan? he asked. Those things are pressed up against the wall, right? the redneck asked. Well, I figure if I get up ahead of steam, I should be able to punch them through with this and hold them in place while you go all Gallagher on them. Dante chuckled. Little early for a sledgematic reference, but we'll roll with it, he said. Ace gave him a little salute and then took a wide turn around the house, Dante close behind. They went out to the far edge of the grass, a good thirty yards away from the zombies that were still stacked at the window. Ace moved forward, but Dante grabbed his arm, holding him back. What's up? the redneck whispered. You see something? Dante shook his head. I don't know, he murmured. Okay? Ace asked. His companion sighed. Sorry, he whispered. Just when they were running up, the girl zombie on the right side there was moving slow. How slow? Ace asked. Dante tilted his head back and forth. I mean, faster than I would have liked, he admitted, but about half the speed as the others. He watched closely, staring at the ghoul, seeing it was even hitting the window a bit slower than the others who were still at full speed. I mean, I got a video camera in the house if you want me to run and get it, Ace teased quietly. Dante shook his head. No, I'm good. Okay. With the way they're stacked up, I should be able to pin two of them together, the redneck whispered, miming the motion with the pitchfork. I'll hold them in place while you deal with the third. Sound good? Dante nodded. Lead the way, he said. The two of them broke out and raced towards the zombies. The grass softened their footsteps and Lily started to yell as they approached to muffle their noise even more. Yeah, you want a piece of this, you limp dick, dead fucks? she bellowed. Ace held the pitchfork out like it was a jousting lance, picking up speed and aiming it for the torso of the teenage zombie in the back. There were two of them stacked up perfectly behind one another, while the slower ghoul was to the right. Ace let out a scream as he thrust, jamming the business end of his weapon through the back of the rear zombie, so hard that it went all the way through to the front one. They didn't even notice, continuing to focus on Lily's taunting. The slow zombie did notice them, however, and turned to the redneck. Before it could fully lean towards Ace, Dante grabbed the back of its shirt and took several steps away from the window, before throwing the corpse into the yard. The hell are you doing? Ace cried. Get them on the ground, Dante barked. The redneck shook his head and pulled the ghouls away from the window. He wrenched the pitchfork to the side, causing them to tumble onto the grass. He leaned forward, skewering them into the grass. Dante swung the hammer down forcefully, driving the weighted end through the back of the top zombie's skull and right into the second one. The single blow was enough to kill both, and the two corpses twitched before falling limp. As soon as they stopped moving, Ace jerked the pitchfork free and swung around to face the third zombie. He relaxed and furrowed his brow when he saw that not only was it not running toward him, it was struggling to even get to its feet. Dante rested the blood-soaked sledgehammer over his shoulder, cocking his head. Good to see I'm not crazy. Motherfucker, you crazy as hell, Ace declared. Just throwing that thing down behind us on a hunch? His companion shrugged. Figure it was worth the risk, he said. How the hell do you figure? The redneck challenged. Dante motioned to the zombie. If these things are slowing down, don't you think that would be useful information to have? He asked. Ace wrinkled his nose, but finally nodded. How do you know she didn't just break a leg or some shit? He muttered petulantly. That's why we gotta watch, Dante replied, and see what we see. They stared at it watching as it finally got its legs under it and shambled in their direction. 
It seemed to be a half-hearted speed walk, and they studied its legs, seeing no bones sticking out or anything looking out of place. You see anything? Dante asked. Ace shook his head. Just a fucked up bitch who needs a head caved in. His companion nodded in agreement and stepped closer to the zombie. He used the top of the sledgehammer to smash her in the chest, sending her tumbling back to the grass. He raised the hammer high and brought it down on her skull with a wet squelch. What the hell was that all about? Lily screeched through the slats in the window. Ace jerked his thumb over his shoulder. Ask your man there, he drawled. Dante knelt down, looking over the dead ghoul to see if there was any special damage that could have caused it to be slow. What's going on? Lily called. What do you see? He stood up, shaking his head, and simply said, Hope. Chapter 2 The group clustered around in the living room, mowing down on pancakes and scrambled eggs. Abigail emerged from the kitchen with a steaming hot pan. Who needs more eggs? she asked. Ace and Bailey both held out their empty plates, and she dished out heaps of eggs before turning and dumping the rest onto Lily's plate. She nodded and offered the older woman a smile. Thank you. You're welcome, dear, Abigail replied, and headed back into the kitchen, getting rid of her pan and re-entering with a plate for herself. So... Are you still dead set on going to see Maddox today? Lily asked, scooping up a fork full of egg. Her cousin nodded. Yeah, Dante was right about the food situation, he said through a mouthful of pancakes, spitting crumbs everywhere, much to Bailey's disgust. So, unless you magically learned how to be a farmer last night, we're going to need someone who knows how to grow. Lily shook her head, letting out an exasperated sigh. If you don't want to go, Dante piped up as he studied the sullen expression on her face. Ace and I can handle it. She wrinkled her nose. Thanks, but... She sighed again. If that slimy-ass fucker is still alive, I'm going to have to deal with him sooner or later. Might as well get it over with. Do you want Philip and me to tag along today? Cam asked, holding up a hand. Ace shook his head. Nope. You boys got some chores to do in our absence, he declared. Philip groaned. Chores? he asked. Really? You can call it whatever you want, the redneck replied. But shit needs to get done around here. Dante leaned forward, setting down his fork. You two did a great job fortifying the house, but now we need you to do it to some of the neighbors' houses as well, he explained. As much as I like you people... Having six of us in the living room isn't exactly a long-term sleeping solution. The boys nodded begrudgingly. But what about zombies? Philip asked. Didn't you say those ones you killed this morning were your neighbors? Ace jerked a thumb over his shoulder. We'll handle that before we go, he explained. While Miss Abigail was cooking, I checked the remaining houses. Only one on the other side of the gas station had some in there. Once we get that cleared... This town is ours. So which house do we start at? Cam asked. Ace and Dante shared a quick glance and the redneck shrugged. The house across the street has a fence, Dante suggested. It's a small chain link one, but it's better than nothing. Get that boarded up and see if you can get something to block off the road and yards up to Ace's. If we have any more visitors, it would be nice to have them waiting on the perimeter instead of knocking on our bedroom windows. The redneck nodded. A fucking man to that, he drawled. They finished up their breakfast and set their plates down. Lily started shoveling her food into her mouth to catch up. Take your time, Dante assured her with a smile, and she nodded in thanks. From best I can tell, there was just one of those things in the last house, Ace piped up. Scarface and I can handle it. You just be ready to go when we get back. Bit of a haul down to Hardyville. She nodded and gave Dante's arm a small squeeze before he passed her. The duo grabbed their farm tool weapons from the porch and headed to the road, walking towards their target house. 
The morning had turned out fairly nice, a bit cool with the breeze, with the sun warming their faces. Fucking zombies, man, Ace declared. Dante raised his eyebrow. Is that in general? Or do you have something specific to curse them about? He asked. Football, man, the redneck whined. Perfect weather for grilling in the backyard before the game started. Then sitting on my ass for twelve straight hours with the case of beer by my side. Stuff in my face while watching grown men give each other concussions. It is a bona fide tragedy that I'm not going to be able to do that this season. His eyes widened and his face went pale. Or any season. He scrubbed his hands down his face. Fuck. It's really gone, isn't it? Dante nodded solemnly. Afraid it is, buddy, he replied. Afraid it is. You a big football fan? Ace asked, taking a deep breath in his misery. Seattle has a hell of a team. His companion shook his head. I would watch a bit whenever Grace was over, he replied. She was a diehard fan, never missed a game. I was kind of indifferent. So your sister's a fan, huh? The redneck asked, cocking a brow. She ever drag you to a game so you could tailgate? Dante chuckled. We talked about it a few times, he admitted. But Grace isn't what you'd call a morning person. Oh man, you are missing out, Ace moaned. Well, just like I'm being your wingman for Lil, I'm going to help you out here too. He ignored Dante's snort and continued. I still got a couple of games on the DVR, so tomorrow morning... I'm going to get up early, and we're going to do a proper tailgate. We're going to grill whatever we can find, drink a few beers before breakfast, and then sit down and watch as a football game. Got to take advantage of that shit while we can. His companion chuckled and nodded. I appreciate that, man, he replied. And you're right. We got to get in that TV watching while we still have power. Fucking fuck, Ace stammered, smacking his thigh. I didn't even think about the power. I was talking about the beer running out. Dante shrugged. Unless there's a direct attack, the power plant should be okay for a few more days, he said. Maybe even a week on its own. Of course, we might actually have power for a while, thanks to the QXR guys. They probably got people addressing that as we speak. Here's hoping, Ace said. I think one of my neighbors has a generator or two and the gas station got refueled a few weeks back. It would get us through in a pinch, but it would be loud as hell. They reached the target house, and he held his pitchfork high. But one problem at a time. This the house? Dante asked. The redneck nodded. Yep. Dante took a deep breath. So, how do you want to do this? I looked in through the front window and saw it wandering around the living room, Ace replied. Checked the other windows and didn't see anything, so this is probably it. Dante studied the front door, noting that it was elevated at the top of four brick steps. He cracked a smile. You like physical comedy? he asked. Physical comedy? Ace blinked at him. Oh, you mean like when people fall down and shit? Hell yeah, I do. His companion motioned for him to stay put. I got an idea, he said. They reached the front door and Dante reached for the knob, but then stopped. He bent over and pulled up the welcome mat, finding a key beneath it. Gotta love small towns, he murmured, and slid it into the lock as quietly as he could. He turned the bolt softly and then wrapped his hand around the knob, glancing at Ace. The redneck stood several feet away from the stairs, pitchfork at the ready. Dante nodded and then threw open the door. Knock, knock, he yelled. A zombie moaned and tore for him, arms outstretched. He jumped out of the way at the last second, and it ran straight ahead, not comprehending the stairs, immediately falling down onto its face. Before it could scramble to its feet, Ace drove the pitchfork into its back, pinning it to the ground. It writhed and flailed and tried to squirm away, but Dante was quick with the sledgehammer, bringing it down hard to crush its skull. As soon as the corpse fell limp, both men dissolved into laughter. 
That is one dumb son of a bitch, Ace declared through his gasps. Of course he wasn't that bright when he was alive, either. Dante waved for him to follow. Let's clear the house just to be safe, he suggested. The duo headed inside, moving swiftly through the rooms, knocking on any closed doors and listening for sound. A moment later, they rejoined each other in the front hall, finding nothing else. Ace led them into the kitchen, opening up the fridge and finding a case of beer. Good news, we're set up to tailgate tomorrow, he said, pulling out the case with a flourish. Well, let's get this meet and greet with Maddox out of the way so we can start prepping, Dante said, and they sauntered outside, heading back to collect Lily. Chapter 3 Ace, Dante, and Lily piled into the truck, the latter in the middle. The rest of the group stood on the porch watching them. Get what you can done today, Dante called through the open passenger window. If there's any trouble, you get in the house and stay there. We'll handle it when we get back. Everybody good on that? There were nods all around, and Ace fired up the truck, waving. He did a burnout as he pulled out of the yard fishtailing a bit on the road as he headed for the highway, making the turn south. So, how far is this place again? Dante asked. Ace tilted his head back and forth. Should take half an hour to get there, he replied. Hoytyville is only about fifteen miles or so, but Maddox has himself a little hideaway down by the river. Got to do a bit of off-roading to get to his place. If he's that far off the grid, there's a good chance he's still alive. Dante said. Lily scoffed. He's a cockroach in human form, she drawled. That's how he's still alive. Guessing things didn't end amicably, Dante asked, avoiding her gaze. There was a long pause, and Ace finally chuckled. You can tell him, Lil, he assured her. I don't think he's gonna run away. Dante raised his eyebrow. That bad, huh? Yeah she replied with a sigh. I caught him in bed with my cousin. Dante wrinkled his nose. Yikes. Oh, that's not all, she replied with a dark laugh. I grabbed a knife from the kitchen and proceeded to chase his naked ass down the street, yelling that I would cut it off and feed it to him if I ever saw him again. Dante blinked at her, and then a smile broke out on his face. So, what you're saying is I should do the talking when we get there, he asked. Unless he's uncooperative, she amended, crossing her arms, at which point I can jump in. Good to know we have a negotiator with us, Dante declared, and the trio erupted into laughter. The road was nearly empty towards Hardyville, save for a single overturned car a few miles outside of town. How big is this town, anyway? Dante asked. A shrugged. Just a few thousand, and it's spread out pretty good he replied. Still, we're not going to chance it. I know the back road's good enough to get us there without going near the center of town. He pulled off of the highway onto a country road, driving for a few miles before hitting the river. The view was beautiful, with tall grass complementing the water and blowing in the breeze. A shame we didn't bring our fishing poles, Dante said. Looks like a nice day for it. Well, if we get Maddox on our side, I'm sure he has a private spot for you to get your fishing fix, Ace replied. If you think I'm a country boy, ooh, you ain't seen nothing yet. He drove along a small road running near the river for a few miles. Dante soaked in the beauty which he knew was going to be in short supply that day, or really for the foreseeable future. Eventually, the truck slowed to a crawl in the middle of the road. It's still a little further up. Lily said. Her cousin shook his head. Nah, we're close, Lil, he insisted. I'm telling you, the turnoff is still a ways up, she snapped. Ace rolled his eyes. And I'm telling you that ever since you threatened to feed his foot long to him, that he put in a new entrance, he replied. She scuffed again. Foot long? She clucked her tongue. That thing barely qualified as a little smoky. Dante chuckled under his breath. There it is, Ace cried, and turned off of the road, rolling through a narrow ditch through a small opening in the trees. 
As soon as they cleared it, they found themselves on a dirt road that wove its way through the forest. Pretty impressive for a small-town drug dealer, Dante said. If you didn't know what you were looking for, you'd drive right past it. Lily nodded. My guess is, that was his brother's doing, she said. Tate ain't a lot of things, but he has their security on lockdown. Yeah, no shit, Ace agreed, pointing up ahead at an eight-foot-tall fence with barbed wire coming across the road and weaving into the woods. There was a call box by the entrance. Lily's eyebrows raised as she appraised the setup. Looks like they've really upgraded their operation, she said. Either that, or Maddox is extremely protective of his... Uh, Dante paused and smirked. Um, goods. Lily laughed as Ace pulled up to the call box. He reached out and hit the button, and it ran a few times before a hoarse voice floated through the speaker. Sorry, we're not entertaining company at the moment, somebody said in a slow, lazy drawl. However, if you're a customer, please note that we now only accept canned goods and nudie magazines. Tell me what you got and I'll tell you what you can get. Ace furrowed his brow. Who the hell is this? he demanded. This is Henry, man, the guy said brightly. Now what can I get you? You can get me Maddox, the redneck said firmly. That's what you can get. There was a sigh through the speaker. Oh, man, Henry whined. He's like in the other room and stuff. Then go get him, Ace demanded. Well, I... Uh, Henry stammered. Now, Ace yelled. All right, all right, the stoner drawled with another sigh. Just chill, man. Who should I say is calling? The redneck leaned his head against the headrest. Tell him it's Ace. Henry snorted. You're named after a playing card? Ace put a hand to his forehead, shaking his head. He was just about to yell again when the line clicked off. After half a minute, he grunted in frustration. That dumbass has about ten seconds before I drive on through this fence and whoop his ass, he growled. Dante chuckled. Might need to give him a little more time than that, he suggested. It didn't sound like he could find the couch he was lying on. Maddox's stuff isn't for the faint of heart, that's for damn sure, Ace muttered. Finally, the call box clicked on, and an irritated voice came through. Who in the hell is this? Maddox snapped. I just want to know who's ass to whoop next time I see him. Boy, you've been trying since eighth grade to get the best of me, Ace said playfully. Didn't happen then. Ain't gonna happen today. Holy shit, is that Ace? Came the surprised reply. The redneck rolled his eyes. Who the fuck else will be coming to see your dumbass in the middle of a zombie apocalypse? He said. Zombie what? Maddox said with a laugh. Shit, man, I was gonna offer you something to smoke. But it sounds like you've been toking it up already. Ace shook his head. I wish, he replied. So, you gonna let me in so I can tell you what's going on? Yeah, come on up, brother, the dealer replied, and the call box buzzed as the gate slowly moved open. Ace hit the gas when the door was clear and sped down the dirt road towards the house. They came around a bend into a clearing with a double-wide trailer sitting about fifty yards away from the river. To one side was a large greenhouse that was twice the size of the trailer. Off to the side, facing the water, were three large solar panel arrays with cables leading to the buildings. Dante blinked, reluctantly impressed. The weed business must be booming for him to be able to afford all that, he said. Living in the middle of nowhere, it's either pot or meth, Ace explained. And luckily, there's a lot of health-conscious people in town. Lily nodded. There is also an art school up the road in Savannah, she added, which doesn't hurt sales either. The trio got out of the truck and she hung back a bit, walking behind them as Maddox stepped out of the trailer. 
flanked by two men and a woman. It's been a while, brother, Maddox said, spreading his arms. Ace shrugged. Yeah, it's been a minute. Now, why you been treating me like a stranger, huh? The dealer asked. Lily stepped out from behind Dante, crossing her arms and raising an eyebrow. Maddox's smile dropped from his face immediately. Oh, yeah. Really? she asked. That's all you have to say? You better check your attitude, skank! The woman next to Maddox stepped forward, pointing a finger as her disheveled hair poofed around her head. Lily tongued her cheek. Excuse the fuck out of me, Miss Trailer Park Queen, she snapped. Bitch! Why do you just call me? The woman shrieked and took another step forward. Maddox grabbed her around the waist and Lily moved towards her too. But Ace caught her wrist to stop her. Ladies, as much as my redneck heart would love to see a full-on catfight, Ace drawled, we have a situation on our hands. The dealer pulled his pouting woman against him, brushing her bangs off of her forehead. He's right, baby, he cooed. Why don't you go smoke a bowl and calm down? She glared at Lily before snaking her arms around Maddox's neck, practically devouring his mouth in a show of possessiveness, before flouncing off into the trailer, slamming the door behind her. Still slumming it, I see, Lily said dryly. Ace pinched her shoulder, shaking his head. She rolled her eyes but kept her mouth shut. One of the pie-eyed guys, presumably Henry, stared wide-eyed at Dante's face and Tate smacked him in the back of the head. Boy, it ain't polite to be staring, he hissed. Man's been through some shit. Just let him be with it. He looked apologetically at Dante, who responded with a nod. Um, Henry stammered, shaking his head and looking at the ground. I'm sorry, sir. Dante smiled softly. It's all right. Who's your new friend here, Ace? Maddox asked. Oh, him? The redneck motioned to his large friend. This is Dante. He's a big old badass who found his way to my doorstep. Maddox stepped up, cocking his head. Big old badass, huh? He asked. So, what makes you so big and bad? I'm humble. Dante replied with a smirk. So you'll just have to stick around and watch me in action. The dealer chuckled. Okay, come on now. I'm gonna need more than that, he drawled. Like what would you do if I grabbed your... He snatched a fistful of Dante's shirt and the bigger man smacked his arm away, catching him around the throat with his free hand. Maddox blinked up at him in shock and then grinned. Tate rubbed his forehead, shaking his head. Yep, Maddox choked out. Pretty good. I think my dumbass brother gets the point, Tate suggested, scratching the back of his head. Dante smirked and let go. Maddox sucked in a lungful and coughed before giving him a thumbs up. I like him, he said hoarsely, and then cleared his throat. Okay, so... You want to tell me what you're doing down here? I'm guessing with your zombie comment, it's not because you need drugs. We've just been referring to them as zombies since it's as good an explanation as any, Ace explained. Tate cocked his head. What makes you say that? he asked. Have you not been paying attention to what's going on out there? Lily demanded, motioning over her shoulder. Henry shook his head slowly. Not since the news went dead a couple of days ago. Man, he drawled. We've been locked up tight here ever since. So, you don't know about the bites? She asked, furrowing her brow. Maddox shrugged. I mean, we know those things try to bite, he replied. But what about them? The people who get bitten are infected, Dante explained. When they die, they come back. Hence, zombie, Ace added. Maddox wrinkled his nose. 
Good thing we didn't let old Chucky bite us then, he said. Who's Chucky? Dante asked. Maddox and his brother shared a look, and Tate nodded. Come on, the dealer said, motioning for them to follow. There's something you need to see. He led the group down a trail through the woods. They walked a couple hundred yards until they reached a shack that was no bigger than ten by ten yards squared. There were a couple of windows that were closed, and the door had been boarded up. Our uncle used to live here back in the eighties, Tate explained. Went abandoned for quite a while after his death. Then we started using it before upgrading our digs. Lily rolled her eyes. Impressive, she mocked. So why did you bring us down here? Maddox opened his mouth, giving her the side eye. But Tate spoke up, pointing. Look in the window, he said. The three stepped up to the window, peering into the dim, ransacked space. Looks like how I would expect Maddox to live, Lily muttered. He pursed his lips, ignoring her, and knocked on the glass. A second later, a zombie emerged from the shadows, shambling towards the window. It didn't have any visible bite marks and looked clean save for the decaying skin. Is there anything wrong with him? Dante asked. Maddox raised an eyebrow. You mean besides being dead as fuck? I mean with his legs, Dante replied, pointing. Could he run before? The dealer nodded emphatically. Oh, hell yeah, he replied. Couple days ago, he said he wasn't feeling well and asked if he could crash out in the cabin. We came down a few hours later to check on him, and he ran like a fucking Olympic sprinter, smacking into the windows. We got bored and started having fun with him, Tate added, baiting him to keep running around the cabin like a crazy person. Dante cocked his head. When did he slow down? he asked. Started getting gimpy yesterday, and frankly just took all the fun out of it, Maddox said with a sigh. Dante and Ace shared a pointed look. Hey now, don't go getting all judgy on us now, Tate drawled, pointing a finger at the visiting redneck. Especially with all the shit you've pulled over the years. Ace shook his head. Nah, it's not that, he said, waving a hand. We think they're slowing down. The stoners looked at each other, confused. Okay, you guys are going to have to start from the beginning, Maddox piped up. Because it feels like we're coming in halfway through. Henry slowly raised his hand, looking nervous. Nobody knew quite how to react until Dante finally pointed at him. Um, yes? he asked. The stoner chewed his lip for a moment with his hand still in the air. Why don't we go smoke a bowl? he asked, and let them fill us in. Well, hot damn, there it is, Maddox declared, clapping his hands together. Is one good idea this week. Come on, let's go have us a chat in comfort. Chapter 4 The four rednecks sat there, dumbfounded, staring at the trio after the long tale they'd just been told. Maddox reached over and grabbed the bong from Henry, taking a long hoot and holding it in for half a minute before exhaling a massive cloud of smoke towards the ceiling. Jesus fucking Christ, he groaned. No military? Mercenaries have taken over? And there are flesh-eating zombies rampaging everywhere. Tate buried his head in his hands. So we're really on our own? he asked. Dante nodded. Yep, he replied. Military just up and abandoned us. So what are you wanting us to do about it? Maddox asked, throwing up his hands. Ace jerked his thumb in the direction of his companion. Dante here had the bright idea of starting to grow our own food. Maddox burst out laughing. 
his bloodshot eyes filled with mirth. Oh, McMaddox had a farm, yow, he sang, and Henry Gafford joined in by Maddox's girlfriend, whose name had turned out to be Tegan. Tate, however, sat in contemplative silence, rubbing his chin. When Maddox realized his brother wasn't laughing, he calmed down, pushing against his shoulder. Come on, you aren't taking that seriously, are you? he asked. His brother shrugged. If those mercenaries are killing people in broad daylight, and the military is gone, Tate trailed off and then shook his head. We have to assume this situation is far worse than we can imagine. Maddox chewed his lip, glancing over at Tegan and Henry, who were still singing old McMaddox and laughing. You two knock it off, he snapped. Henry clamped his mouth shut and Tegan pouted. You really going to talk to me that way? She whined. Yes, he replied. And if you ever want to smoke any of my shit again, you're going to be quiet. She crossed her arms and flopped back against the couch, screwing her face into a comically dramatic scowl. Maddox contemplated for a moment and then leaned forward. Man, I'm not even sure where to begin, he groaned. Henry, what do you think? What the hell are you asking that teenage burnout for? Lily blurted motioning to the red-eyed redneck. Tate pursed his lips. Because he's our plant specialist, he said. Henry sighed, rubbing his eyes before blinking rapidly. How much food we talking? Assuming we add more to the group, Dante paused, thinking for a moment. Revolving food supply for twenty people? Henry pulled a phone out of his back pocket and started hammering away at the calculator. He twisted his lips as he ran some numbers and then shook his head. Well, for starters, he said, we're going to need a much larger setup than we have here. Maddox cocked his head. How big are we talking? School gymnasium size, Henry replied. Ace threw up his hands. Where the hell are we supposed to find that? he asked. How about we just take over a school gymnasium? Tate suggested. Dante shook his head. Even if we could take one over, he replied. It would be a huge target if QXR gets this far out. That's the beauty of it, Tate declared with a smile. This school is abandoned. Has been since the nineties. Maddox nodded, snapping his fingers and pointing at his brother. And it's isolated, he added. A couple miles outside the city... They build it out in the country since a lot of the smaller towns fed into it. Then, in the late 90s, the town decided to build one closer to downtown. We still have extra solar panels, right? Henry asked. Maddox jerked a thumb over his shoulder. Yeah, I got a few I haven't broken out yet, he confirmed. Hardware store guy couldn't pay his bill, so he gave me solar panels instead. Best deal I made in a while. You tell us what we need, and we'll get it for you, Dante said. Maddox shook his head. Shit, man. What we really need is Francis, he said. You ain't kidding, Tate agreed. He'd be loving this right now. Who in the hell is Francis? Ace asked. Our cousin from Florida, Tate explained. He moved up here a few months back. Been helping out with things around here. Maddox clasped his hands together. We really should go get him, he said slowly. That's gonna be a hell of a job, Tate reminded him, letting out a deep whoosh of breath. It's okay, his brother declared, motioning to Dante. We have a big badass over here. Ain't that right? Dante raised his eyebrow, chuckling. We can certainly add Francis to the list, he agreed, but we really need to get the food going. Francis needs to come first, Maddox insisted, because, as luck would have it, he's on the clock, so to speak. 
Ace furrowed his brow. Where is he that he's on a clock? County jail up in Ridgeland, Tate replied. Lily gaped at him. You want us to break into a jail for one of your lackeys? He's much more than a lackey, sweetheart, Maddox said, and she grimaced at the endearment. Tegan scoffed with disapproval, but simmered down at her boyfriend's icy stare. And knowing those boys up at the jail, Tate continued, they probably bailed out at the first sign of trouble, which means he hasn't had food or water in a few days. Ace shook his head. Man, that is one hell of a risk, he said. Do you really think he's worth it? Maddox bristled, but Tate leaned forward to defuse the situation. Before he moved up here, he would get work every Halloween as a celebrity impersonator, he said. Ace raised an eyebrow. Oh, yeah? he asked. Who is he impersonating? Andre the Giant. Tate declared. Ace let out a low whistle and then slapped his knees. Okay, I'll get the truck, he said. We got a jail to break into. Before we do that, Dante said, holding up a hand, we're going to need a plan. I imagine breaking into a jail, even a county one, isn't going to be all that easy. Maddox jerked his thumb over his shoulder. We got a welding torch in the cabin he said. We'll just have to deal with old Chucky to get it. That's not a problem, Dante said. Torch should get us inside without issues, Maddox continued. Same with the cell. Last time I was there, they were still using the old school locks with the oversized keys. Dante nodded slowly. Sounds like a secure facility there, he said. It's a county jail in a small town, Tate drawled. Ninety-nine percent of the people in there got popped for DUI or drugs. Dante cocked his head. And what did Francis do to get in that one percent? Maddox chuckled. He body slammed two people at a bar, he replied. At the same time. Liking this guy already, Ace said with a grin. Henry tore a sheet of notebook paper from the pad he'd been writing on and handed it over to Maddox. What the hell is this? the dealer asked, brow furrowing. It's a shopping list, Henry explained. There's a great little farming supply store in Ridgeland that should have everything on that list. Maddox crossed his arms. The fuck I look like, your mom? he snapped. Get off your lazy ass and get ready to go to the store. Question, Lily piped up, holding up her palm. Does anybody else besides Henry know how to grow food? Nobody moved or said anything. She raised her eyebrows. Didn't think so, she said firmly. That makes Henry the most important member of this group, so he's not going anywhere. I'm important too. Tegan piped up, so I shouldn't have to go out there. Lily rolled her eyes. Sucking little smokies ain't important, she muttered under her breath. What did you say? The other woman snarled. She was just reminding me to ask if you guys had more weapons, Dante said quickly. Ace nodded, stifling a smile. Yeah, our supply is limited, he added, to say the least. Tate and I got handguns, Maddox replied. That's about it. Some drug kingpin you are, Lily scoffed. He glared at her. The fuck I look like? The head of the Rivas cartel? He snapped. I'm a small town weed slinger. I don't have any need for heavy artillery. Before she could argue, Dante patted her leg and got to his feet. Well, if you know any place to get heavy artillery, he said, if QXR comes a-knocking, we could use it. Maddox and Tate shared a look, and the later shrugged. We might know of a place, he said. But first things first, it's time for a jailbreak. Chapter 5 
The drive to Ridgeland was mostly quiet, with only the occasional zombie sighting on the side of the road. A side street sometimes came into view within sight of the interstate, which was devoid of life. No cars, no zombies, no nothing. It's like the world just stopped on a dime, Dante mused. Don't think I've ever seen an interstate that empty. Lily shook her head. No real reason for people to be on the road, even on a good day outside of going between Savannah and Charleston, she explained. Outside of transport trucks, that is. Port of Savannah, right? he asked. Yeah, it's a trip going over that bridge into town, she replied with a nod. Gotta be tall enough for those ships to squeeze under. Really get you up there. Ace barked a laugh. Hell, it took me till I was twenty-two before I owned a car with a good enough engine to make it up that incline, he added. Well, if these zombies keep slowing down, we might have to pay Savannah a visit, Dante suggested. Could be some useful stuff in those shipping containers. The three of them thought about it for a few moments as they reached the town line. Ridgeland, much like Hardyville, was a small town of a few thousand people. The jail was just a few blocks north of the farming supply store, which meant they had to venture into the heart of town. Maddox slowed his truck to a stop ahead of them, reaching his arm out the window to motion for them to pull up beside. "'Why do y'all want to hit first? he asked as Dante unrolled his window. "'I think it's going to be smarter to hit the farm supply store first, he replied. "'That said, how close is the jail to the store?' Less than a mile, Maddox replied. Dante nodded thoughtfully. I think we should do a drive-by of the jail, he suggested, just to see what we're up against. It's a fucking jail, Maddox drawled. I mean, what are you expecting us to be up against? Dante cocked his head. Well, we had a crowd of zombies around the TV station when we went, he explained. These things have a tendency to congregate around buildings if they think there are people in it. If we're going to have substantial company, it might be good to know, don't you think? Maddox glanced at his brother in the passenger seat. Tate shrugged. Man's got a point, he said. Yeah, yeah, all right, Maddox said with a sigh. Ace, I'm gonna be hauling ass, so you stay on my bumper. Lead the way, brother, Ace called. Maddox smacked the side of his truck to fire himself up before slamming on the gas. Ace hit his, easily catching up to him. They cut straight through the center of town, moving at a fast clip. As they went by the streets, Dante and Lily peered down to see what was going on. Focus on the left, he instructed. I'll cover the right. As they flew by the side streets, they looked down them for zombies. While there weren't any major congregations of them, there were still several packs numbering as high as what looked to be two dozen in a single group. Dante furrowed his brow with worry. If they weren't careful, they could have a horde fairly easily. There's the supply store, he said as he spotted it down one of the empty streets. We're looking good down there, at least for now. Let's hope it stays that way, Ace replied. They came out of the downtown area into a residential community, which was a lot quieter than downtown. There were still a few packs of ghouls roaming about, including one or two that ran out in front of Maddox's truck. He plowed right into them, crushing them under his tires as he didn't even let up on the gas. Each time he'd pump his fist out of the driver's side window. Enthusiastic, isn't he? Dante asked dryly. Lily rolled her eyes. That's an understatement, she replied. No matter how trivial the accomplishment, he'll let you know how awesome he was. I can see why you dumped him, he said with a chuckle. That sounds exhausting. You have no idea, Lily drawled. Ace slammed on the brakes, lurching everyone forward and barely missing Maddox's rear bumper in the process. Muttering obscenities, Ace curled the wheel and backed up driving around to come up alongside the other vehicle. "'What the hell, man?' he demanded. Maddox pointed in the direction of the jail. 
The trio stared front and froze at the sight of two dozen ghouls clustered by the front entrance. Well, ain't that a kick in the dick, Ace breathed. Maddox nodded sheepishly. Yeah, hoping you boys got an idea of how to get past them, he said, because that front entrance is the only one there is. Let's get back to the farming supply store, Dante suggested. Maybe we can find something in there. Chapter 6 The two trucks pulled up outside of the small farming supply store a block off of the main road in a row of shops. They quickly hopped out, looking around for any ghouls that were wandering around, luckily finding none. Maddox immediately headed for the front entrance, but Dante held out an arm to stop him. Hold up there, bud, he said. We have to be prepared for anything in there. Maddox stopped in his tracks, nodding and taking a step back. Ace approached, holding out to Dante. You wait here for a moment, the larger man said and approached the front door, peering in through the large glass panel. He didn't see any movement, so he jammed the tip of the crowbar into the door latch to pop it free with a single push. As soon as he breached the store, he heard shuffling and moaning, followed by multiple sets of feet rushing towards him. He stood his ground in the doorway, watching intently in the dimly lit store. A moment later, a zombie tore around the corner, almost running completely past him before spotting him and adjusting course. As it whirled, Dante cracked it in the head with a horizontal swing, sending it flying face first into the ground. The second ghoul tore up the aisle directly in front of him, moving considerably slower than the other one, though still faster than a shambler. As he waited for it to reach him, the rest of the group clustered around his back, watching it. Please tell me that's going to happen to all of them, Lily breathed. One can only hope, Lil, Ace said, shaking his head. One can only hope. God damn, what the fuck happened to it? Maddox moaned, staring wide-eyed at the multiple bite marks across the zombie's body. That's what those things do to you, Lily replied. They rip you up. He didn't respond, simply watching in horror as the ghoul grew close enough for Dante to impale it with the crowbar. With its skull crushed, the corpse crumpled to the floor. Once it was down, there was silence. Just to be sure, Dante leaned down and smacked the floor a couple of times with the metal. But there was no response. Let's get what we need and get moving, he instructed, leading the way inside. As he secured the door behind them, he pointed to his companions as he spoke. Lily, Ace, start pulling everything we need for the farm. Just stage it by the door, and we'll load everything up at the end. You two, let's figure out how to get past those zombies at the jail. Everyone leapt into action, Lily and Ace rushing off with the list to pull things from the shelves. Dante and the brothers headed over to the closest checkout counter to game plan. Okay, I'm open to ideas. Dante declared. Tate shrugged. In my experience, he said, a propane tank and a flare seems to work pretty well in clearing a crowd. And leveling the front half of the building, Maddox added dryly. Dante shook his head. Not to mention attracting every zombie in a two-mile radius, he replied. We need something smaller. There are probably some smaller propane canisters for torches and stuff, Tate suggested. That could work. Maddox raised an eyebrow. That ain't gonna pack enough punch, is it? We'd have to get several of them, that's a given, his brother confirmed. Is it going to create much shrapnel? Dante mused. These things aren't going to be hurt by the concussion blast. Tate shook his head, pursing his lips in thought. Lily passed by with an armload of seed packets and dumped them into a shopping basket by the cache. Why not just make some potato cannons? she asked. You want to attack these things with potatoes? Max drawled, rolling his eyes. No, dumbass, she snapped. I said a potato cannon. You do realize you can fire anything out of those, don't you? Just has to be packed tightly. He sneered at her. Potato, rock, whatever, he said dismissively. It's still not going to take out the horde. 
She shook her head, pointing to a display against the wall behind them. The three men turned and spotted the nuts and bolts section, filled with thousands of small metal objects. You're a genius, Dante breathed, nodding in approval. She smirked. Just motivated to get you boys done with your planning so you can help us carry this shit, she said flippantly. But thank you. She winked at him and hefted a bag of potting soil over her shoulder and strolled over to the door. I've never made a potato cannon before, Dante admitted to the guys. Is it difficult? Tate shook his head. Nah, just need some PVC pipe, a drill, and some sort of flammable agent, he explained. Shouldn't be difficult to find here. However, they aren't very durable. Might only get a shot or two out of them before they risk shattering, especially with the velocity we're going to need. So we're going to need to make a few. What about the tightly packed object? Dante asked, studying the wall. Can we get the bolts tight enough? Tate approached the display and looked for a moment, hand over his chin. Finally, he found a plastic bag dispenser and tore one off, pouring a couple handfuls of bolts before wrapping up tight. He tossed it over to Dante, who inspected it with a smile. I'd say that works, he said. Let's get to building. Tate nodded. If you want to start backing these up, Maddox and I will start building the cannons, he suggested. Get them about halfway full and set them to the side. We'll adjust the size when we get them assembled. Dante nodded and headed for the display. But as he reached for the bag, Ace yelled from the front door. We got company, he barked. Everyone tensed, drawing their guns and ducking. What do you see? Dante called. Ace peered out from behind the wall. Carload of people. Three, no, four, just got out, he said. They're walking this way. QXR? Dante demanded. No, civilians, Ace replied. Armed? Yeah. Dante took a deep breath. Stay low, I got this, he declared, and then turned to Tate. Let's flank them. I do the talking, and don't fire unless I do. Good? Tate nodded and moved down a few aisles before heading towards the front of the store. Dante moved down the aisle one over and crouched down by the side. The front door opened and somebody said, I don't know about this, in a worried voice. There are trucks out there. We need ammunition, and this is the only place in town to get it, somebody else said. We'll be in and out quick, I promise. These trucks are probably abandoned anyway, like all the others we passed. Dante emerged to face two men and two women, varying in ages between thirty and fifty. Sorry to disappoint you, but those trucks aren't abandoned, he said. The oldest man's eyes widened and he raised his hands. The other three immediately raised their hands too, one of them holding a shotgun by the barrel, arm shaking. Now we're not going to hurt you, but I'm going to need you to put that shotgun on the ground slowly, Dante instructed. The man nodded and slowly placed the weapon on the ground. As soon as it was down, Tate emerged from behind them, grabbing the weapon and stepping back into the main aisle, out of their reach. Now, what are you doing here? Dante asked, crossing his arms. The man shook his head. We don't want any trouble, he said shakily. I appreciate that, but that's not what I asked, Dante said firmly. What are you doing here? We're getting out of town, the man explained, but we used up most of our bullets just getting out of our house. We came here to restock before hitting the road. Road to where? Tate asked. My brother has a farm a couple hours north of here, near Kingstree, the man said, and the woman behind him tugged on his shirt in a panic. Oh, relax, woman. If they wanted us dead, they'd shoot us here. They aren't going to track us to Kingstree. Tate cocked his head. City life ain't cutting it for you any more, he asked, lowering his gun. Dante motioned for the group to put their hands down, and everyone relaxed. Not after what we heard about Buford, the oldest man replied. Buford? Huh? Tate asked. What did you hear? The man turned to his companion. Billy, you want to tell him? He asked. My girl and I live in Buford. 
At least we did until this morning, the young man next to him said. A bunch of men with guns started going through neighborhoods, shooting those things, but also pulling people out of their homes. Not a lot, mind you, but a fair number of people that were just holed up hoping for rescue. We were like that too, until we saw them roughing them up and throwing them into the back of a truck. He winced, swallowing and shaking his head. We got in the car and took off. Dante cocked his head. How did you get across the bridge? He asked. Dumb luck, really, Billy replied. They were just pulling up to block it off when we sped by them. They fired a couple of shots but didn't follow us. We didn't know what to do, so we came here to her Uncle Jack's place. The older man, apparently Jack, nodded. And when they told me all that, I loaded them up in the car and we came here, he added. I don't know who those boys are, and I get the sense I don't want to know them. I am too old to be fighting. They're mercenaries from the QXR group, and you're right. You don't want to know them, Dante said. Jack raised an eyebrow. Sounds like you know that first hand, he said. Wish I could say otherwise, Dante replied. Tate inclined his head towards the group. You said you came here for ammunition, he asked. Didn't know they had that here. There's not much, mind you, but they got a cage in the back room, Jack explained. Come on, I'll show you. He stepped forward slowly and Dante motioned for him to lead the way. Jack reached underneath the counter behind the register, pulling out a set of keys. He led them into the back room, which was a small storage area. There was a four-foot-tall metal cage with a swinging gate, and he unlocked it, opening it up. Well, I'll be damned, Tate breathed as he looked over the forty boxes of ammunition. I had no idea this was back here. Dante cocked his head. So, what do you need, old-timer? Could use a couple boxes of twelve-gauge, Jack replied. Maybe a couple of nine mil, if you can spare it. If you're sticking around here, you're going to need more bullets than we're going to. Dante and Tate shared a look, nodding in agreement. Go ahead, and take a couple boxes of each, Tate said. We'll manage. Jack nodded in appreciation and grabbed four boxes. He shifted from foot to foot and then lowered his voice. For the love of God, don't tell my wife what I'm about to tell you, he said quietly. She's not really the trusting type, and there's already enough things out there trying to kill me. We got your back, Dante assured him, chuckling. Jack took a deep breath. My brother's farm is isolated and mostly automated, so he's going to have food, he whispered. Has a whole processing set up right on site. If this thing stretches on like I think it will, and you boys get hungry, you come see us up in King's Tree. I'll leave a map to the farm in the King's Tree post office, under the register. The boys nodded, and Dante shook his head. Very kind of you, sir. We do appreciate it. Tate added as he shook his hand as well. I fear hard times are ahead of us, Jack said, shaking his head. Good people are going to be harder and harder to come by. The fact you didn't put us down and take our stuff shows me you're better than most. They headed out of the back room, and then Dante clapped the older man on the back. Hey, before you go, I think I saw some jerky by the counter, he suggested. Can't have a road trip without snacks. Billy? Why don't you get us something for the road? Jack asked, and Billy broke away from the door to load up on jerky. The group congregated by the door and Jack poked his head out to make sure the coast was clear. You boys stay safe out there, he said, and remember my offer. We will, sir, Dante said, and you be safe so that your offer can stand. Tate nodded in agreement and handed the shotgun back over to him as they bustled outside to their car. Once they fired it up and headed off, Dante nodded and secured the door. All right, let's get back to work, he declared as Maddox emerged from hiding. We have us a jailbreak to get to. Chapter 7 The two trucks pulled up within a block of the jail, stopping next to each other. All right, badass, Maddox drawled. How do you want to do this? Dante nodded. We got three guns total, he said. Ace will drive us to the other side of the lot, which should attract a good number of them. 
Lily and I will take out as many as we can with our shots. You block off the other side of the lot and do what damage you can. And what if there are some still standing after we hit them hard? Tate asked. They can't climb, Dante explained. So just hang out in the truck and beat them down. Maddox furrowed his brow. Well, why in the hell didn't we just do that in the first place? He demanded. Because, dumbass, Lily piped up, you get enough of those things and they can tip over a truck. He thought about it for a moment and then shook his head. So, we doing this or what? He urged. Lily and Dante climbed up into the back of the truck, sitting against the cab, their potato cannons beside them. They sat on top of several bags of soil and other goods for the farm, which made a decent seat. When they were in position, Lily pulled out a can of compressed cleaning solvent, spraying a generous amount into the firing chamber of the cannon. That looks like a lot, Dante commented. She nodded. Oh, it is, she agreed. But it needs to be. We need this stuff to hit hard, right? Dante smiled and nodded as she primed his cannon as well. She banged on the back of the truck, prompting Ace to start driving. Y'all hang on, he said through the back window. This might get bumpy. His passengers in the back braced themselves as Ace sped through the parking lot of the jail, hitting a speed bump and sending them off of their seats a bit. When he reached the other side, he slammed on the brakes. You're good, he bellowed. Dante and Lily stood up, racing over to the edge of the truck and setting up their potato cannon barrel on the truck gate. They looked out and saw about fifteen or so zombies racing towards them about twenty yards away. Wait until they're close, Lily instructed. He nodded, following her lead, since he wasn't sure exactly what the cannons were going to do. She stared down the ghouls, spread out a couple yards apart from each other, but still fairly tightly packed. Hit em, she cried, and both sparked up their lighters, pressing a flame to the firing chamber. A moment later, there was a significant boom as both cannons fired. The result was a blunderbuss, sending shrapnel flying through the air at high velocity. The nuts and bolts smacked into zombie skulls, dropping half of them in a single shot. Their heads exploded in a spectacular display of red goo. Even with the success, eight or so were still racing towards the truck. Reload! Dante yelled. Lily took a knee as he grabbed his crowbar, awaiting the coming enemies. The first corpse hit the side of the truck and he gave it a forceful strike to the top of the head, slumping it over. Before he could strike again, seven more slapped into the vehicle, causing it to rock a bit. Arms flailed, reaching over the end gate at them. He swung down again, but the constant movement of the truck wobbling made it difficult for him to aim properly, and his blow landed on a shoulder. He grunted and pulled back, striking again, this time hitting a head. Reloaded! Lily yelled, and he turned to aim the makeshift cannon as she lit it. The force of the blast at point-blank range eviscerated the zombie heads, sending skull and brain fragments flying several yards behind them. The shot was so good that only one ghoul remained, and Dante quickly smacked it down. Nice shooting, he declared as he stood back up. Lily brushed off her shoulder playfully. What can I say? she asked, batting her eyelashes. You don't grow up in a rural town and not know how to shoot one of these. A moment later, there was another boom from the front of the jail. They looked over and saw that Tate had taken down most of his pack, leaving only a couple that he took out from the back of the truck with a baseball bat. Lily smacked the roof. Back it up, they're good, she called out. She and Dante knelt down as Ace swung the vehicle around, bringing them back up to the entrance. Maddox jumped out of his truck, carrying a small handheld welding torch. Cover me! I'll get the door, he said. The group formed a semicircle around him, looking out across the road, hoping that their potato cannons hadn't attracted any more company. Maddox fired up the torch, going straight to work on the locking mechanism. It didn't take long for the flame to burn bright, and the metal began to melt away. A few moments later, the door fell open. We're in, he said, hooking the torch to his belt as the other readied their weapons, preparing to go inside. Dante entered first, gun aimed high. 
he quickly swept the small lobby area, finding not much of anything. There was an overturned chair and some magazines strewn about. Not sure if a fight took place here or they just really messy, Ace said, looking around. Dante tongued his cheek. Let's assume the former, he said. Maddox pushed the door closed behind him and grabbed the overturned chair, dragging it over to wedge it under the handle. This ain't gonna do much if a bunch of those things show up, he said. But at least with it closed, they might just walk by it. Dante nodded. So, where's Francis going to be at? he asked. Probably the main holding cells in the back, Maddox replied, and led them over to a door that led to a long hallway that cut through the entire building, straight to the back. As soon as he got through, there was an office on the left that he stopped at. He tried the doorknob, but it was locked, so he used his gun to smash open the glass, reaching in to unlock it. They entered the room, and it was a small guard post. There were several monitors in there that showed various parts of the jail, and what they could see wasn't very encouraging. Several packs of zombies roamed about, ten, maybe fifteen total across the main hallways. They found a monitor showing the main holding cells, and there were half a dozen ghouls in there all congregating around one cell. That's gotta be Francis, Tate hissed. Maddox looked around the room, finding a microphone. He went over to it and checked the buttons, finally flipping a switch. Yo, Francis, he said into the mic, and his voice echoed throughout the hallways on every speaker. It's your cousin, Maddox. If you're in that cell, give us a sign. They watched the monitor and one of the zombies' heads disappeared between the bars. A moment later, the body convulsed and fell backwards, missing its head. Oh yeah, that's him all right, Tate declared. Dante took a deep breath. Now, we just gotta figure out how to get to him, he said. My potato cannon should be good for another shot, Tate said. Lily nodded. We have one left too, she added. Mine is starting to crack after that second, but and I'd rather not blow my hand off if I can help it. I'll go grab them, Tate offered. I'll come with, she said. Going alone isn't exactly advice these days. As they turned to leave, a walkie-talkie on the far end of the table clicked on. All right there, Maddox, a firm aged male voice came through. Why don't you pick up the radio so we can have ourselves a chat before you go and do something stupid? Maddox froze, eyes wide and unsure. Maddox, you dumb son of a bitch, the man growled. You just announced you were here over the loudspeaker, so I know you're in the office and can hear me. Now pick up the damn radio. He sighed and picked it up, clicking the button and raising it to his lips. Judging by your friendly tone, he drawled, I'm going to guess this is Sheriff Brand. Congrats on solving one mystery there, the sheriff replied. Now maybe you can solve one for me. I seem to recall that the last time we met, I said in no uncertain terms if you ever came into my county, I was going to put you in solitary confinement and lose the key. Now you want to explain to me just what in the hell you're doing here? Maddox sighed. Not sure if you noticed or not, Sheriff, but the world has kind of gone to shit, he said forcefully. So my friends and I came up here to get Francis out before he starves to death, because judging by the monitor, Nobody has been in to see him for a while. Now you sure this is Maddox? The sheriff drawled. Because that sounds way more selfless than I would have thought you could muster up. Now if you were smart, you'd go ahead and walk right back out that front door and never look back. Because if you try and break him out, I'm going to beat you down and lock you up with him. Once Francis is done serving his time, he'll be released. Maddox growled. But before he could respond, Dante let out a whistle and waved him over. He pointed to a pack of zombies, eight strong, that congregated around an office door on the other side of the building. The redneck grinned. I know full well you think I'm a moron, he said into the walkie-talkie. And chances are you can find some people who would agree with you. Lily gave an enthusiastic thumbs up from across the room and he flipped her off. However, I'm smart enough to pick my friends right. 
and they figured out that you're trapped like a rat in the East Wing office. There was a long pause, and he smirked at the silence. Judging by your silence, I'm going to guess I'm right, Maddox continued. So if that's all, we'll be on our way. He set down the radio, and they began to leave the room. Before they reached the door, the walkie-talkie cracked to life. Hope you weren't planning on cutting him out of the cell with one of those little propane cutters, the sheriff said, a note of teasing in his voice. Maddox froze, glancing at Dante and then rushing back to the table to pick up the radio. And what if I am? he demanded. Then you're exactly the dumbass I thought you were, came the pert reply. We installed steel doors earlier this year. Maddox threw down the radio and clenched his fists. Fuck! Fuck! Motherfucking fuck! He snarled. Calm down, Dante said, holding up a hand. What is it? Maddox motioned to the torch attached to his belt. This thing doesn't get hot enough to cut through steel. Shit, Dante replied. Judging by your silence, I'm guessing I was right. The sheriff echoed Maddox's earlier words with a mocking tone. How about we work out a deal? The group looked around at each other. Let's hear him out, Tate suggested, and there were nods all around. Maddox raised the walkie-talkie to his lips. Okay, we're listening, he said. Go over to the control panel by the monitors, the sheriff instructed. Punch in 23, then the pound sign. Dante did so, and it changed one of the screens to an office. Sheriff Brandt stood in there with two other officers. Yeah, we see you and your friends, Maddox said into the radio. Good, came the reply. This is what I propose. You and your friends get us out of here, and I'll give you the key. The redneck rolled his eyes. So we're just supposed to take your word that you have the keys on you. Brandt set down the radio and walked closer to the camera, pulling out a set of keys from his belt. He held up the ring, showing off a large key that looked like it was for a jail cell. Shit, Maddox said, shaking his head. What do you guys think? Dante shrugged. It's risky, but I don't see another way, he admitted. Tate? Maddox asked. His brother nodded. I agree with our new friend here, he said. Maddox took a deep breath and raised the radio to his mouth once again. Okay, Sheriff, you got a deal, he said. But when we get you out, you and your boys just walk on out of here and leave us be. If you think it's bad in here, you ain't seen nothing yet. The whole world has gone to shit and getting out is the best thing for you. There was a long pause, and then Brandt finally said, Deal. Now come get us. Maddox tossed the walkie-talkie down on the desk in disgust. Can't believe I have to help that motherfucker, he snarled. Guessing we can't trust him to keep his word, Dante said. Oh, fuck no. He's a lying sack of shit, the redneck replied. Vindictive, too. One of his underlings made the mistake of treating me with some respect, joking around with me one day. He not only berated that officer in front of everyone, but demoted him to the overnight shift. Tate crossed his arms. You think he's going to screw us? I think it's hella possible, Maddox confirmed. We'll cross that bridge when we come to it, Dante piped up. In the meantime, we have to worry about those zombies. Lily smacked Tate on the arm. Come on, let's get those potato guns, she said. The two rushed outside and Ace smacked Maddox on the arm. There any other place in here that could have some useful stuff? He asked. The dealer thought for a moment before responding. Couldn't hurt to look in the chow hall, he replied. Weapons are going to be minimal, but there should be some rolling carts. Dante nodded. We can use that, he said, and then glanced at the monitor. You two grab what you can and get back. Doesn't look like any of those things are near the cafeteria. Just stay quiet. What are you going to do? Ace asked. Figure out how we're doing this, Dante replied. The redneck nodded, and the duo rushed out of the room. 
Dante moved back to the monitors, focusing on the office with the zombies around it. He thought hard, running through a variety of plans in his head, none of which sounded particularly good. Chapter 8 The five of them stood in the small office at the front, going over the plan. There was a single pushcart in front of them that normally held lunch trays, and two potato guns laying on it. Okay, we know how many they have, but they don't know about us, Dante said. I think it's in our best interest to keep it that way. Maddox nodded. Agreed, he said. He's going to be expecting you, Dante continued, pointing at him. I think Ace and Tate should go with you. At least you have the numbers, even, which will hopefully deter them from doing something stupid. Tate raised his hand. And if they do decide to do something stupid, he asked. If you can safely take them down, do it, Dante replied. But don't risk it. Lily and I will have your backs. Maddox shot Lily a suspicious glare and she rolled her eyes. Don't worry, dumbass. If anybody's going to kill you, it's going to be me, she drawled. And it ain't going to be today. He nodded, somehow comforted and went back to focusing on the mission at hand. Tate picked up one of the potato launchers as the three men shoved handguns in the back of their pants. They left the other cannon in the office, but brought a cart along with them. We'll keep watch at the monitors, Dante said. Good luck. The three men set down the hallway, weaving through the maze-like halls towards the office near the back. They stayed silent, not wanting to attract attention to themselves even the wheels squeaking along the floor feeling too loud. When they reached the corner that led to the office, Tate peeked around it, seeing eight zombies by the door. The hallway was fairly wide, about ten feet across. He ducked back behind cover, leaning in to speak quietly. Okay, I'm going to blast them with this thing. Then get back behind cover, he whispered. Whatever doesn't drop is going to be hauling ass after me. Maddox, I want you to use this cart to knock them on their ass. Ace, we aren't going to fuck around with them either. Pick your shot and pop it in the head. Hopefully letting these asshole cops know we have guns will keep them calm. The other two nodded in agreement as Tate picked up the potato cannon. He checked to make sure the nuts and bolts were packed in tightly, and then took a deep breath. He stepped back several yards away from the corner and used the compressed lubricant to fill the firing chamber hoping the sound was muffled, enough not to alert the ghouls. Ready to strike, he walked back to the corner, peeking around to make sure they were still occupied with the door. He stepped around, walking halfway down the hall as noiselessly and slowly as he could, stopping about ten yards away before lighting it up. The boom was deafening, the sound bouncing off of the walls, but the impact was excellent. The metal shrapnel ripped through the horde, shredding several of them. Four of them dropped to the ground with significant head wounds. Those corpses fell into the others, knocking over two more. The final two let out loud moans and sprinted towards him. Tate immediately backtracked, tearing around the corner, and Maddox appeared with the cart, holding it tightly as the zombies got close. He rushed up and rammed it into one creature, sending it tumbling down to the concrete. The other was several steps behind, but Ace aimed and fired, hitting it in the head. As the one on the floor tried to get back up, Tate circled around Maddox and shot it in the face. The other two, knocked down ghouls by the door, found their footing and rushed the trio. Both Ace and Tate had time to line up their shots, firing a couple of times each to drop them. In the aftermath, the three men stood stock still listening hard to wait for more zombies to appear. Much to their surprise, nothing else emerged in any direction. Come on, let's get these assholes out, Tate muttered. Maddox approached the door, kicking a couple of the downed ghouls to make sure they were dead for good, and there was no movement. He smacked the door a few times with his open palm. All right, Brant, you're good to go, he bellowed. Time to honor your half of the deal. A moment passed, and then the deadbolt clicked. The door opened and the sheriff stood there, looking smug. 
His two officers sat on a desk in the back of the room. Well, well, you actually did it, he drawled. Maddox nodded sharply. Yeah, we did it, he replied. Now, give me the key and get the hell out of here. They're on the desk over there, Brent jerked a thumb over his shoulder. Let me go grab them. Maddox followed him inside, and as soon as he crossed the threshold, there was the sharp click of a shotgun cocking. Fuck my life, he muttered. Glancing over at the corner, there was another officer standing right under the camera, wielding a shotgun. The sheriff casually walked over to the desk, picking up the keys and clipping them to his belt. You didn't actually think I would be stupid enough to tip my hand, now do you? He drawled, hooking a thumb into the top of his pants. Apparently we did, Maddox growled. Brent waved a hand. Okay, boys, you have until the count of three to get in here, or old Maddox here is going to be missing a head, he drawled. One. Calm your tits, Sheriff, Tate said, and he walked in with Ace, both men's hands high in the air. Oh, it's you two. Why does this not surprise me? Brandt shook his head. Well, I stand corrected. It does surprise me a bit that you three have managed to survive whatever this is as long as you have. Y'all saw the world ending, and you just had to pay me another visit. Is that it? He sneered. Or did you just miss this place? Ace raised an eyebrow. I've never been in here, he pointed out. Not for lack of trying, the sheriff said. I know you've started shit in my county, yet somehow always slipped away. That isn't happening this time, he motioned to the officers behind him. Boys, get their guns if you don't mind. One of them grinned as they stood up. With pleasure, he said. Once they'd collected the weapons, he asked, So, what do you want to do with them now? Well, they came in here to be with their giant-ass cousin, Brent said with a smirk. I say we take them there. Plenty of cages they can get comfortable in. Chapter 9 Dante and Lily watched on the monitor as the sheriff and his three men captured their companions. Fuck, she muttered. He shook his head. Don't worry, we'll get them out, he assured her. Oh, I know, Lily replied. I'm just upset that I have to save his dumb ass. Dante smirked as he picked up the potato gun, holding it out to her. Come on, let's go get him. They headed out of the office, walking down the hallway. Rather than go for a straight assault, they went towards the holding cells in the back, ducking into a small office a few doors before the main gate to the cell. You know what we're doing, right? Dante whispered. She nodded. Yep. They laid in wait for the seven men to come closer. There was a glass panel on the door which Dante positioned himself to see through while remaining behind cover. He watched as their friends walked by first, followed by Brandt, and then the shotgun officer and two others. Dante nodded to Lily, and she returned it, ready to roll. He peered out towards the gate, watching as Brandt unlocked it. As soon as it was open, Dante motioned to Lily, and she opened the door. He moved swiftly, stepping out into the hallway and firing twice, hitting the two officers in the back, striking their vests, and knocking them to the ground. The shotgun-toting officer turned and fired, prompting Dante to keep rushing across the hall and crashing through the door. He hit the ground hard, forcing the gun out of his hand. He scrambled to get it, but the light darkened behind him as the shotgun-wielding officer stood in the light. You just fucked up, buddy, he declared, and raised his weapon. Dante took a deep breath as he stared down the barrel, but then the officer's face exploded and he slumped to the floor. Lily stood behind him, holding her handgun. Get him! Brandt screamed and a few bullets hit the doorframe, forcing Lily into the room. Dante scrambled across the floor, grabbing his gun and ducking out the door at the wounded officers approaching the door. They retreated, firing blindly, forcing Dante to slide to cover across the hall. I don't know who you are, but I'm assuming you're with these three assholes, Brant screeched down the hallway. You have five seconds to throw out your guns, or else I'm going to blast a hole through this motherfucker's head. He cocked back the hammer on his revolver and pressed it against Maddox's head. The redneck chuckled at the massive size of the weapon. Compensating for something, he drawled. 
The sheriff shoved it into his temple even harder with a growl. One, two, three. Okay, we're sliding out the weapons, Dante called, shoving both handguns out the door. The two officers, still nursing the bruising they'd taken when they were shot in their vests, moved up at the motion from the sheriff. They moved cautiously together. The first one reached the door and turned towards Dante's room. Let me see your hands, he demanded, finding Dante sitting up against a desk casually. Let me see your hands. The large man casually raised his arms, looking past the officer for his friend to make the turn into Lily's room. As he did, Dante curled his hands around, giving two middle fingers to his attacker. Mother for the officer cried, but was cut off by the blast of Lily's potato cannon. The officer at her door fell as the shrapnel ripped through his face, the rest smacking into the back of Dante's officer. Dante didn't waste time as his attacker doubled over in pain and rushed him. The officer tried to recover and raise his weapon, but Dante grabbed his wrist and pushed it down, sending a bullet into the floor. He delivered a sharp uppercut, catching the officer under the chin and stunning him. He reached back, grabbing him by the back of the head and pulling him close, sending a headbutt to the bridge of his nose the impact causing his attacker to drop his gun. Staggered, the officer was helpless as Dante choke-slammed him into the floor, his head smacking against the cement and knocking him woozy. As this happened, the other three in the hallway took on Brandt. The blast startled him, giving Tate an opening to shove his arm away from Maddox's head. Maddox ducked as well, but Brandt still pulled the trigger, missing but partially deafening his captive. Tate held the gun arm in place, and Ace wrapped his arms around the sheriff's neck, cutting off his air supply. Let go of the gun, he snarled, and I let go of you. Brandt struggled to hold on, but finally relented, dropping the revolver. Ace held on for another few seconds, just to prove a point, before finally letting go. Tate shoved the sheriff against the wall, holding him in place by the throat. You move, I squeeze, he said firmly and I'm not as nice as Ace here. I won't let go. The sheriff nodded jerkily. Jesus, motherfucking tap, fucking dancing Christ, that hurt, Maddox bellowed, rubbing at his ear viciously. I think my eardrum is gone. Tate rolled his eyes. Suck it up, brother, he drawled. One less ear to hear that nagging girlfriend of yours with. He spotted Dante emerging from his room and called, You two all right? Dante ignored him, focusing on Lily, as he walked across the hall to her. She sat against the far wall, staring off into space in shock. Are you okay? he asked gently, kneeling down in front of her. When she didn't respond, he put his hand on her shoulder. Lily, you did good, he said. We're safe now. She looked up at him, and then wrapped her arms around his shoulders for a beat, taking in a deep breath before getting emotional. I'm good. I'm good, she assured him, and looked past him at the mess in the hallway. You saved my life back there, Dante said, snapping her away from looking at the dead bodies. Twice. She smiled. I figured if you were going to make me save that ass hat, I was going to save you as well, she said. Give me some good memory of today. He chuckled, and she joined in, dissolving the tension in the room. Hey, are you two all right? Tate called again. Come on, we're not done yet, Dante said, standing and holding out a hand to her. Lily took it, getting to her feet, and they headed out towards the others. We're good, Dante called to the others. You boys okay? Yeah, Tate replied. We're gonna have to listen to this one whine all the way home, but other than that, we're golden. He inclined his head towards Maddox, who was still rubbing his ear and moaning. Dante looked at the ground, picking up the shotgun and his handgun before grabbing the other woozy officer and shoving him down the hallway towards Brandt. Lily collected the rest of the weapons from the dead bodies. What do you say we go get Francis? Dante asked. The group walked down the hall to another gate, and Tate forced the sheriff to open it. Around the next corner was the cell block, and Francis sat inside, six heads stacked up nearly in the corner. Six headless zombie corpses lay in the hallway. 
It's a good thing we risked our lives to come rescue him, Ace drawled. He might not have been okay otherwise. Lily rolled her eyes. He still needed to get out of the cell, she said, poking him in the ribs. Hell, at this point, kind of surprised they didn't bend the bars, her cousin shot back. Get his keys, Tate said. Maddox ripped the key ring from Brant's belt and opened the cell next to Francis. In you go, Sheriff Douchebag, he said with a flourish. Tate shoved him in and Dante guided the still wobbly officer in after him. Maddox slammed the cell shut and locked it. You're making a huge mistake there, buddy boy, the sheriff growled. Maddox smirked. Oh, am I now? he asked. Doesn't look like it from my perspective. Brandt leaned on the cell door, staring menacingly through the bars. You should know my officers are out there, and they're going to come find me, he hissed. And when they do, I'm going to hunt you down, find the deepest hole in all of the low country, and throw you in it. Maddox made a puppet out of his hand, pretending to mouth along. Blah, 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 he mocked. And how many days have you been thinking that while locked in that little office, huh? Do you have even the foggiest idea of what's going on out there? He leaned in, smirking. Nobody is coming for you. Any officers you have out there are probably already dead. And if by some miracle they ain't, they sure as shit ain't risking their lives coming to rescue your ass. The world outside is dead, and the people who are still alive couldn't give two shits if you ever get out of that cell. The sheriff clenched his jaw, eyes finally showing a flicker of fear. So, you're just going to let us die in here? he asked. Lock us up like animals to starve to death? Yep. Maddox replied brightly. That's what you were going to do to us. That's what you were doing to Francis. Why should you be any different? He hocked a big loogie into the sheriff's face. That's for breaking our deal, asshole. He headed off towards Francis. Brandt reached through the bars towards Dante, eyes wide. You're not part of that group, he pleaded. Don't throw your life away, son. Dante stared down his nose at him. If you do, get out of here, he said in a level tone. Hopefully you'll have learned your lesson, and will honor future deals. He headed off, Lily beside him, raising her hand to flip off Brandt as they moved away. Maddox unlocked Francis's cell door, throwing it open. The beastly man sat on the edge of his bed, which was barely enough to accommodate even half of him. He was leaning forward, elbows on his knees, in such a casual pose Dante almost wanted to laugh. You ready to blow this joint? Maddox asked. Francis cracked a smile and stood up, joining the group. Dante, Lily, and Ace stood in awe, even the tallest barely coming up to his pecs. Good to see you, cousins, Francis said, his voice a deep rumble. And new friends. Tate motioned to the others. This is Dante, Ace, and Lily, he said. The trio nodded politely and said hello in unison. Is it true what you told the sheriff? Francis asked, turning to Maddox. Is it really that bad out there? The redneck nodded. It's actually a whole lot worse, he admitted. So I hope you're ready to bust some heads. Oh, I'm ready, Francis replied, cracking his knuckles. He glared at Brent. And if we don't leave now, I'm going to get started. Tate clapped him on the back. Let's get going then. The group headed off, and Maddox hung back, dangling the keys in the air in front of the sheriff. He turned and shot them like a basketball into the cell across from them, grinning as they splashed into the toilet. I always thought I could have gone pro, he quipped, punching a victory fist into the air. Well, enjoy starving to death, asshole, he declared, and then glanced at the officer who had finally sat down on the bed. Oh, and if I were you, I'd make the first move. 
because this dick is totally going to kill you in your sleep and cannibalize you. The officer's eyes widened and Maddox laughed, sauntering off. Brandt kicked the bars and screamed curses, but they fell on deaf ears. Chapter 10 The trucks pulled up to the school outside of Hardyville, and it looked like it had been abandoned for ages. The grounds were overgrown with tall grass and weeds, the front door completely ripped off and graffiti covering just about every square inch of the building. The group hopped out of the trucks, standing in front in a line to appraise the situation. Looks like a grade-A shithole, Ace drawled. Maddox grinned. Yeah, but it's our grade-A shithole, he said, smacking the other man on the shoulder. There are any signs of civilization around here? Dante asked. Tate shrugged. Couple of mid-sized neighborhoods about half a mile away, he replied. Other than that, there's not much. Dante nodded. I think we should proceed like these people evacuated and took refuge in the school, he suggested. Come too far to get caught off guard now. They nodded and collected their weapons from the vehicles. Well, come on, Ace finally said as he handed Dante the crowbar. Let's go check out the farm. They walked up to the school, staying cautious as they approached the door. Both Dante and Tate took the lead, heading in first to aim their guns down the hallway as soon as they entered. The environment hadn't been kind to the building, with all sorts of dead grass and leaves as well as trash blowing down the long corridor. There were lockers running along both sides of the hall, the ones closest to the door showing signs of significant rusting, as they were close enough to get rain when the wind was blowing. As they walked, they made sure to check every classroom, most of which were empty. However, some desks remained. There was graffiti on most of the walls, and signs of squatters and drug usage littered about. Looks like quite the party spot for the local teenagers, Lily said dryly. Maddox shook his head. Doesn't surprise me, he replied. Cops don't give a shit about this place. Came out here a few times when I was in school. Hell, pretty sure some of this graffiti is mine. Lily looked to her left and found a large painting boasting Iron Maiden rules, with a crude drawing of their mascot. This can't be yours, she drawled. Not only is everything spelled correctly, but it's also great taste in music. He opened his mouth to retort, but there was a loud moan. Everyone froze at the noise, except for Francis, who stepped forward and smacked the locker with his open palm. The thin metal crushed inwards, sending a loud echo down the hallway. The moan intensified, followed by footsteps pounding the floor. A moment later, a zombie tore out of a nearby classroom, heading straight for them. Francis stepped a few yards away from the group, readying himself as the others watched, transfixed. The ghoul raced straight towards him, and he reached out with his large hand, grabbing the creature by the throat. He picked it up off of the ground, its limbs flailing about before grabbing its waist and pile-driving it straight into the ground. The zombie's head completely vanished, shattering into a thousand pieces, coating the floor with blood and brain. The giant straightened up, swiping his massive palms against each other, a smug smile on his face. Told you he was worth rescuing, Maddox declared. Ace nodded, eyes wide. You weren't fucking kidding, brother. They continued to the end of the hall where the gymnasium was. They looked through the windows into the darkened room, with some stray beams of sunlight piercing through the skylights. So much for natural sunlight, Maddox muttered. Ace grinned. Maybe we can have Big Fella here punch some holes in the wall? Francis glared at him, and the redneck shrank away. I'm sorry, he stammered, holding up his hands. The giant smirked and clapped him on the back, shaking his head. Well, let's go check it out, Maddox said, and pushed open the door. As soon as the door scraped across the dirty floor, moans and a chorus of footsteps echoed towards him. Shut the door! Shut the door! Tate screamed. Maddox quickly pulled the door shut, and a few seconds later, a dozen or so creatures crashed into them. Jesus! Where the hell did they come from? He gasped. 
Dante peered over their heads, spotting an exterior door that was slightly ajar, held together with a chain. Look like the back door, he said. They got in and chained it shut. And what? They just sat in the dark? Maddox asked, throwing up his hands. Tate shook his head. Probably had a camping light or something, he replied, but then waved his hands in front of his face. Doesn't really matter, though. We just gotta figure out how to clear him out. I'm sure as hell not opening the door again, Maddox replied. As soon as they get a handhold, they're gonna throw it open. Dante tilted his head back and forth. Just getting it open a little would be good enough, though, he said. We have the ammo, so we could shoot through the cracks and take them out one by one. I don't know about you, but I don't want to get that close to the door and have them be able to grab me, Maddox replied. Oh, hell, pull me in. Ace shrugged. Why don't we just shoot through the glass at them, he asked. Tate leaned in, looking close and knocking on the pane a few times. Safety stuff, he said suddenly, shaking his head. It would take a lot to punch through it. Then we have the problem of getting them to line up in front of them. With the door open, they'll be trying to get in, but we could be waiting a while. As they talked, Lily looked around, spotting an exterior door about fifteen yards away, with a long chain wrapped around it to keep the swinging doors locked together. She politely tapped Francis on the shoulder and he looked down at her, following her, pointing to the chain. He smiled and nodded before walking over to it. The others trailed off from their conversation as they watched him grab onto the chain, putting his foot on the door and pulling hard. It took a few moments, but finally the release bar on the door cracked, breaking away, and then it snapped completely free. Which door do you want? he asked as he approached. Dante nodded. Middle? he asked. Francis nodded and put the chain through the metal release bar on the door, stretching it several yards back and wrapping it around his wrists, holding tight. Bracing himself, he gave Dante a nod. Whenever you're ready, he said in his gruff voice. Dante pulled out his handgun and walked to the door. Here we go, he said, thankful for the awesome giant on their side. He hit the release and Francis let a little give on the chain so the door could open a few feet. As soon as the zombie arms jetted through the opening, he tightened his hold to make sure that the door held fast. Dante lined up his shot, popping off one by one. For each zombie that hit the ground, another one rushed in to take its place. Dante took his time selecting his shots and hitting each one, all while the door stayed fast thanks to Francis and his strong arms. This went on for several minutes, until finally the last ghoul dropped. Just to be sure, Dante smacked on the door a few times, listening to the sound echo in the gym. There were no returning moans or footsteps. I think we're clear, he said. Francis cocked his head. Are you sure? he asked. Yes, thank you, Dante said, and the giant let go of the chain. The door didn't move at all with the mountain of dead bodies clustered around it. The group stepped over the corpses, filing into the gym. I'll get us some light, Dante said, and jogged over to the far end to the exterior doors. He peered through them to make sure there were no other surprises and then pushed them open. The sun drenched the dust-covered floor, revealing a few small tents and camping equipment, as well as several pools of blood. Guess they didn't know about the bites. Ace muttered. Maddox shook his head. That's gotta suck. Thinking you've survived and that you're safe, only to have your friend or mother wake up and start ripping your throat out, he said. Is this going to be big enough? Dante asked as he walked back over. Ace shrugged. Damn well better be, he said. Tate nodded. I think if we can find enough lights... We can branch out into the classrooms if we need to. I tell you what, Maddox said. Why don't I go get our boy Henry, and he can tell us what he thinks. I could use a nap on a real bed, too, Francis piped up. Maddox grinned. Don't worry, big man. I'll hook you up. 
The giant approached Lily, Dante and Ace, extending his massive hand to shake them all in turn. Thank you for coming to rescue me, he said sincerely. You didn't have to risk your life for me, yet you did. I will do my best to make sure I live long enough to repay you for your kindness. You keep cracking skulls like you're doing, and we'll call it good, Ace declared with a grin. Lily rolled her eyes. What my cousin here means is that there's no repayment necessary, she said. Go get some rest, Dante said. We have a lot of work ahead of us. Francis smiled and nodded before heading off with Maddox. Yo, bro, you coming? The later called. Tate glanced at Dante, who had a concerned look on his face. Nah, you go ahead, he replied. We got some stuff to handle here. Suit yourself, Maddox said, waving him off. I'll bring you back something to eat. As the duo disappeared, Tate approached Dante, crossing his arms. I can see it on your face, he accused. Spit it out. If this many people came from the nearby neighborhoods, Dante said slowly, we could have a whole lot of trouble waiting in the wings for us. Tate nodded, taking a deep breath. I was kind of thinking the same thing, he said. Do you want to do a quick tour? Dante asked. Tate motioned to the door with a flourish. After you, he said. Ace, do you and Lily feel comfortable staying here? Dante asked. We need to make sure this place is locked down tight. Lily smiled at him. We'll take care of it. Ace took his keys out of his pocket and tossed them over to Dante. Just don't ding up my truck, he warned. Dante chuckled and led Tate outside. Chapter 11 Dante drove with Tate in the passenger seat and they drove around a small neighborhood half a mile from the school. So far, there had only been a couple of zombies that had run up to them, and Tate put them down with a precise shot to the head. The neighborhood was part tranquil, part war zone, just depending on which house they went by. From the looks of it, several families had been able to leave, but others weren't so lucky. Three streets down, Tate said. One more to go. Dante turned onto the next street, stopping short when they spotted a pack of ten zombies in the road. They hadn't noticed the vehicle yet, milling around each other. What do you think? Tate asked. Dante cocked his head. You don't happen to know a good auto body repair shop, do you? He asked dryly. Tate chuckled. Maddox and I have been restoring a 67 Impala, he offered. Good enough for me, Dante said, and then floored it picking up speed. The roar of the engine attracted the ghouls, and they immediately sprinted for them. The truck hit sixty when the first zombie impacted the front bumper, completely demolishing it. The ghouls behind it bounced away, flying in various directions. A second later, Dante slammed on the brakes when they cleared the mini horde, looking back and seeing a lot of devastation in his wake. Three zombies still stood, unscathed. Three coming up, he said and both men readied their handguns, waiting for the ghouls to reach them. As soon as the corpses came up alongside the truck, each man popped off shots at near point-blank range, dropping them. Shall we inspect the damage? Dante asked. Tate nodded. Just make sure you clear the truck when you get out, he said. They made sure to jump away from the vehicle, which ended up being a good plan, as there was movement beneath. One of the ghouls crawled out from underneath it towards Dante squirming and writhing with busted legs. Tate shook his head as he came around to look at it. These things just keep coming, don't they? he asked. Yeah, Dante replied, and fired, putting the zombie down. The duo walked around to the front of the truck. The front end was beat up a bit, covered in blood. Tate let out a low whistle. Ace ain't gonna be happy with you, he drawled. Dante crossed his arms. We totally got surrounded, right? he asked. Oh, without a fucking doubt, Tate replied, and they cracked up together. As they headed back inside, Dante shook his head. You know, I'm not a fan of how that thing got underneath the truck like that, he admitted. You and me both, Tate agreed. 
would be way too easy for one of those things to get tangled up in the axle, or even in the engine. Dante sighed. There goes my big dream of doing donuts to take out big crowds. Nah, man, you can dream big, the redneck assured him. Just means we gotta find you a monster truck. Dante's eyes widened. You can find those around here? he asked. Tate chuckled. You ain't from around here, are you? His companion shook his head. Seattle? Shit, man. We're going to add a trip to the dirt track to our list, the redneck replied with a grin. I'm going to make you a country boy yet. Chapter 12 Dante and Tate pulled up to the school gym, seeing one of the sets of doors popped open. Ace emerged from inside, putting his hands to his forehead. What happened to my truck, man? he cried. Tate shook his head sadly as they exited the vehicle. We were fucking surrounded, man. Zombies everywhere, he said. Dante had to punch it or we were done for. Ace nodded, though sadness still covered his face. Well, as long as y'all are safe, man, he said. Dante glanced at his partner in crime, receiving a wink. And don't worry, Tate continued, clapping Ace on the back. We'll get it fixed up for you. Lily came outside, swiping her palms together. How did the neighborhoods look? She asked. Clear now, so we should be good out here, Dante replied. At least from hordes. We should still have someone keep watch for stragglers, Tate suggested. Dante motioned to the building. How are we looking in there? he asked. Henry is still looking around, Lily replied. A few moments later, Henry came outside, flanked by Maddox, with Tegan hanging off of his arm. She stroked his chest, glaring at Lily. So, what's the verdict? Tate asked. Henry shrugged. I can make this work, he replied. But we're going to need lights to make the indoors work. That's going to take some time to get, Ace said. Time we don't really have, Tate added. Henry nodded. Which is why our main focus is going to be the football field, he said, and waved for them to follow him. They headed around the gym to the field, which was overgrown, but had a fence around it. It's not too late in the season, so if we can get this cleared and plowed in the next week or so, I can still get some stuff planted. What kind of stuff are we talking? Maddox asked. Henry tilted his head back and forth. Beets, lettuce, maybe some spinach if we can find it. Ugh, that does not sound appetizing, Tegan whined. Sounds better than starving to death, Lily snapped. Dante sighed. How long is that going to take before we can eat it? he asked. Six to eight weeks, Henry replied. Which is why we're going to have to stagger everything when we plan it. Doesn't do as much good to have an entire field's worth of food ready at the same time when we won't be able to eat all of it. Tate pursed his lips. No way to store it, he asked. We can try canning, but it's going to be limited, Henry said. Not exactly a huge supply of the raw materials we'd need. Dante cocked his head. Still, if you can make us a list of what to look for, we'll do our best, he suggested. I can do that, Henry replied, nodding. But in the meantime, I think we've done all we can do today. The sun is starting to get low and this place is nowhere near ready to be staying at. Yeah, I'd rather not be out on the road at night either, Ace agreed. Maddox nodded. So, are y'all gonna come back down tomorrow to do some shopping? He asked. Ace glanced at Dante, who nodded in agreement. Yeah, I think this takes priority over everything else, don't you? He asked. Maddox nodded. Agreed. You drive safe, Tate said, and headed over, shaking everyone's hand. 
Maddox approached and did the same, but Lily simply glared at him, arms crossed. For what it's worth, you did good today, he said gently. She jutted out her chin but nodded in acknowledgement. As they headed off, they heard Tegan laying into him. The words were unintelligible, but they could tell she was pissed. Giving praise to an ex in front of your girlfriend, Ace drawled. That's a man sleeping on the couch tonight. Told you he was a dumbass, Lily muttered. Dante chuckled. I can see why you left him. They clambered into the truck and Ace fired it up, rolling down the window to hang his arm out. Dante turned and watched Lily as they drove away, and she was blankly staring ahead, not really looking like she was staring at anything at all. You okay? he asked softly. She nodded. Yeah, I'm good, she replied with a smile. I worked customer service before all of this, so I'm used to dealing with dumbasses. That's not what I mean, he replied. She paused and swallowed hard, staring straight ahead. Her jaw was tight, and it looked like she was fighting tears. Dante reached out and grabbed her hand, and she squeezed back. I'm rattled a bit, she admitted, but I'll be okay. They shared a small smile and continued holding hands as they headed for home. The End Up next, with zombies on the island still being a major threat, Grace, Troy, and the other members of the QXR civilian squad are sent on another dangerous mission in Low Country, Part 5. <laughs>